the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Uh, Manu, appreciate it, and uh, many thanks to Santa Barbara City College for hosting tonight's event. I also want to thank uh, the James S. Bauer Foundation uh, for their generous support of the event. Um, the lecture series tonight honors Frank King Kelly, who was a founder and Senior Vice President of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Um, Frank uh, gave the inaugural address uh, for this lecture series and attended every lecture series, uh, but passed away in, at the age of 96 last year. So this is actually the first of the lectures in this series that Frank won't be here, but I can uh, well imagine his smiling face uh, with us tonight. He was a man of boundless optimism. He believed that humanity had a great future and that everyone deserves a seat at humanity's table. Um, perhaps humanity will indeed have a great future if more of humanity is in fact able to find a seat at that table. In recent weeks, we have seen images of the people of Tunisia and of Egypt uh, standing up, going to the streets, and demanding a seat at that table. Uh, they've been demanding change. They remind us that often it is necessary to stand up before you'll be given that seat. They have inspired many of us by their courage and commitment in demanding the departure of dictators. As Frank Kelly recognized, humanity's future is threatened by nuclear arms, which are weapons of terrorism, whether in the hands of non-state actors or in the hands of great nations. Nuclear weapons imperil civilization and the human species itself. The great challenge of the nuclear age is to abolish nuclear weapons, and history, I think, gives us some cause for hope. In the 19th century, humanity triumphed by abolishing institutionalized slavery. In the 19th and 20th century, the women's rights movement struggled and humanity triumphed. In the 20th century, there were also great movements for independence from colonialism and for human rights and civil rights, bringing new triumphs for humanity. In the 20th century, the Berlin Wall fell, the, 20, the Soviet Union split apart, South African apartheid was overcome, humanity triumphed. These movements were led by courageous leaders, including Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, Mahatma Gandhi, Eleanor Roosevelt, Nelson Mandela, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, to name a few. But the 20th century also gave rise to two world wars, to countless other wars, to the Holocaust, and to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the 21st century, we must abolish nuclear weapons before they abolish us and find better ways to achieve security than by force of arms. Peace and the abolition of nuclear weapons are the principal goals of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. 
the goals we have advocated now for nearly three decades. We have been a voice of reason and conscience and an instigator of thought and action on this critical issue. If humanity is to have a great future, it cannot afford continued complacency. It must awaken and engage in confronting ongoing nuclear dangers. Nuclear weapons are one genie that actually must be returned to the bottle. Peace is an imperative of the nuclear age. Our lecture tonight for the 10th Kelly Lecture is Robert Green, a retired commander in the British Royal Navy. During his service, he actually had operational responsibility for nuclear weapons. He left the Royal Navy in 1982, having served then for 20 years. Since that time, he has been an ardent campaigner for a world free of nuclear weapons. He played an important role in the World Court's advisory opinion on the illegality of nuclear weapons. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him and his wife, Kate Dews, on the Middle Powers Initiative, a project that seeks to stimulate middle power governments to apply pressure to the nuclear weapons states uh, to change their policies and achieve a world without nuclear weapons. Rob Green is one of the most intelligent and dedicated individuals that I know working for a nuclear weapons free world. He is the author of The Naked Nuclear Emperor and most recently, uh, Security Without Nuclear Deterrence. His concerns with nuclear deterrence go to the very heart of the justification for nuclear weapons. If deterrence is flawed, so is our common security and that of our nation and the world. Please join me in welcoming our 2011 Kelly Lecturer, Commander Robert Green. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When David Krieger invited me to give this lecture, I discovered the illustrious list of those who had gone before me, beginning with Frank King Kelly himself in 2002. I was privileged to meet him the previous year when my wife Kate and I last visited Santa Barbara. So I feel quite a weight on my shoulders. However, this is eased by an awareness of the uplifting qualities of the man in whose memory I have the huge honor of speaking to you this evening. As I do so, I invite you to bear in mind the following points made by Frank in his inaugural lecture. I quote, I believe that we human beings will triumph over all the horrible problems we may face and over the bloody history which tempts us to despair, unquote. He pointed out that some of the scientists who brought us into the nuclear age made us realize that we must find ways of living in peace or confront unparalleled catastrophes. A nun who taught him, warned him he would be tested, that he would go through trials and tribulations. As President Truman's speechwriter, Frank discussed the momentous decisions Truman had to make, including this one. I quote, when I asked him about the decision to use atom bombs on Japan, I saw anguish in his eyes. He made it clear that he felt the weight of what he had done. My experience in the Truman era indicated to me that the American people were not well informed about what was really going on in other countries and in the United States, unquote. So I have done my best to take all this wisdom to heart in what I now have to say about breaking free from nuclear deterrence. 
First, I will try to answer two challenging personal questions. People often ask why I am the only former British Navy commander with experience of nuclear weapons to have come out against them. Others in the peace movement asked me why it took me so long. <laughs> in some ways, I am a child of the nuclear age. I was five days past my first birthday when 24-year-old Theodore Van Kirk, navigator of the Enola Gay, helped conduct the first nuclear atrocity on Hiroshima. Then in 1968, I too was a 24-year-old bombardier navigator when told my buccaneer strike jet pilot and I had been chosen as a nuclear crew in our squadron aboard the aircraft carrier HMS Eagle. After being cleared to see top secret information and indoctrinated about the honor and heavy responsibility of this role, we were given our target, a military airbase on the outskirts of Leningrad. We had to plan how to get there undetected from somewhere in the Norwegian Sea. This meant choosing the shortest route over Sweden, a neutral country with very capable air defense. Our mission was to deliver a 10 kiloton WE-177 tactical nuclear bomb and then try to get back to our carrier or at least bail out over Sweden or Norway. When I discovered there would not be enough fuel because the target was at the limit of our aircraft's range, my pilot shrugged and said, well, Rob, if we ever have to do this, by then there won't be anything to go back for. So we submitted our flight plan and celebrated our initiation into the nuclear elite. 30 years later, I was shocked to land at my target, to attend an anti-nuclear conference on European security on the eve of the 21st century. During the taxi drive into St. Petersburg, I understood how my bomb would have caused massive civilian casualties from collateral damage. So on television that evening, I apologized to the citizens of Russia's ancient capital. Then I told them I had learned that nuclear weapons would not save me or them. Back in 1972, after retraining in anti-submarine warfare, I was appointed as senior bombardier navigator of a Sea King helicopter squadron aboard the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal. Our task was to use variable depth sonar, radar, and other electronic sensors, plus a variety of weapons, to detect and destroy enemy submarines threatening our ships. However, our lightweight anti-submarine torpedoes were not fast enough or could go deep enough to catch the latest Soviet nuclear-powered submarines. So we were given a nuclear depth bomb, an underwater variant of the WE-177 design. The problem was that if I had dropped one, it would have vaporized and irradiated one Soviet nuclear submarine, a large vol volume of ocean, and myself. This was because, unlike a strike jet, a helicopter was too slow to escape before detonation. So it would have been a suicide mission. Also, my leaders ignored the fact that there would have been heavy radioactive fallout from my bomb, plus the submarine's nuclear power plant, and any nuclear-tipped torpedoes it carried. And I might have escalated World War III to the nuclear holocaust. All this just to protect my aircraft carrier. This time I did complain, but I was reassured. There would almost certainly be no need to use nuclear depth bombs, no civilians would be involved, and the Soviets might not even detect it. Besides, I had a glittering career ahead of me and did not want to spoil my prospects, did I? As I was ambitious, and no one else raised concerns, I fell silent. In due course, I was promoted. However, the experience of such military incompetence and irresponsibility shocked me into a less trusting, more questioning frame of mind. That potent military tradition 
carefully nurtured to carve out and hold down the British Empire, was immortalized in Tennyson's Crimean War poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, about an earlier suicide mission. I quote, there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die, unquote. That attitude was alive and well in an all-volunteer Royal Navy. This was when I realized the significance of the fact that, unlike most of my colleagues, I had no military pedigree. My father worked in the Ministry of Agriculture. His father was a priest and a divinity teacher at Trinity College, Dublin and my paternal great-grandfather was an engineer. On my mother's side, her father came from a line of professional gardeners and horticulturalists. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher swept into 10 Downing Street as Britain's first woman prime minister. I was working just across the street as a newly promoted commander in the Ministry of Defense. In my position as personal staff officer to the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff Policy, I watched my Admiral facilitate the internal debate on replacing the four British Polaris nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarines. The nuclear submarine lobby insisted upon a scaled-down version of the massively expensive, over-capable United States Trident system, despite threatening the future of the Navy as a balanced useful force. Mrs. Thatcher rammed the decision through without consulting her cabinet and the chiefs of staff, despite misgivings, were brought into line. My final appointment was a staff officer intelligence to Commander-in-Chief Fleet. It was a stimulating time to work in military intelligence in the command bunker in Northwood, just outside London, who where operational control of the British Navy was coordinated. The Soviets had just invaded Afghanistan. The Polish trade union movement, Solidarność, was pioneering the East European challenge to them. And new Soviet warship designs were emerging almost every month. I ran the 40-strong team providing round-the-clock intelligence support to the Polaris submarine on so-called deterrent patrol, as well as the rest of the fleet. In 1981, the Thatcher government, desperate to find savings because of their determination to have Trident, announced a major defense review. With projected cuts to the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers, destroyers, and frigates, my chances of commanding a ship, the next step to higher rank, were slim. So I took the plunge and applied for redundancy. Notification of my successful application came one week into the Falklands War. In 1982, Britain suddenly went to war with an erstwhile friend, Argentina, and the Royal Navy's role was pivotal. So the war was directed from northward by my boss, Admiral Sir John Fieldhouse. At one point, the outcome was in the balance. Our ships were being sunk and some friends and colleagues killed. If Argentine strike aircraft or submarines had sunk an aircraft carrier or troop ship, before the landing force got ashore, the British might have risked defeat. What would Mrs. Thatcher have done? Until then, she had been the most unpopular prime minister in British history. Now she had become the Iron Lady and needed a military victory to save her political career. Polaris had not deterred Argentine President Galtieri from invading the Falkland Islands. With victory in his grasp, would he have believed, let alone been deterred by, a threat from Mrs. Thatcher to use nuclear weapons against Argentina? Yet after I left the Navy, I heard rumors of a very secret contingency plan to move the British Polaris submarine on patrol south within range of Buenos Aires. The submarine was fitted with 16 launch tubes, each housing an intercontinental ballistic missile equipped with three 200 kiloton warheads. Then came corroboration from France. Francois Mitterrand was president in 1982. In 2005, his psychoanalyst's memoirs revealed 
that in his first counseling session, Mitterrand had just come from an extremely stressful phone call with Thatcher. A French-supplied Exocet missile, fired from a French-supplied Argentine Navy Super Etendard strike jet, had sunk a British destroyer. Mrs. Thatcher had threatened to carry out a nuclear strike against Argentina unless Mitterrand ordered his brother, who ran the Exocet factory, to release the missile's acquisition system frequencies to enable the British to jam them. Mitterrand, convinced she was serious, had complied. These nightmarish rumors led me to confront the realities of operating nuclear weapons for a leader in such a crisis. Defeat would have been unthinkable for the British military and would have ended Mrs. Thatcher's career. She was a true believer in nuclear deterrence. Yet if she had threatened Galtieri with a nuclear strike, he would have publicly called her bluff and relished watching President Reagan try to rein her in. The Polaris submarine's commanding officer, briefed by me before going on patrol, would have been faced with a shift of target. Had he obeyed the order, Britain would have become a pariah state, its case for retaining the Falklands lost in the international outrage from such a war crime, especially against a non-nuclear state. Nuclear deterrence failure would have compounded the ignominy of defeat. Back in 1982, on terminal leave after the British retook the Falklands, I was 38 years old with no qualifications except my rank and experience. Tired of weekend commuting to high pressure jobs in London, I decided to try my luck and find local work which allowed me to be home every night. So I became a roof thatcher, enduring many painful jokes with stunned former colleagues. For eight idyllic years, I loved working with my hands in the open air, restoring fine old houses with a bird's eye view of some of the most picturesque parts of Southwest England. Thatching proved vitally therapeutic in 1984, when my beloved aunt Hilda Murrell was murdered. My mother's elder, unmarried sister, she had become my mentor and close friend after my mother died when I was a 19-year-old midshipman. Hilda was a Cambridge University graduate and a successful businesswoman who ran the family Rose Nurseries. In retirement, she became a fearless environmentalist and opponent of nuclear energy and weapons. At the age of 78, she applied to testify at the first British planning inquiry into a nuclear power plant. Mrs. Thatcher was determined to introduce a program of reactors of a design which failed at Three Mile Island. Hilda, who had a formidable network of establishment contacts, did her homework about the insoluble problems of radioactive waste. A true patriot, she was not prepared to let the nuclear industry ruin and poison her country, and potentially the rest of the planet with nuclear weapons. Rumors of nuclear conspiracy swirled around an incompetent police investigation into her bizarre murder. Then in December 1984, a maverick member of parliament announced in the House of Commons that I had been suspected of leaking secret documents about the controversial sinking of the Argentine cruiser General Belgrano in the Falklands War and hiding them with my aunt. I had done nothing so stupidly treasonable, yet several reliable sources agreed that state security agents had allegedly searched her house. A cold case review resulted in the 2005 trial and conviction of a petty thief who was 16 years old in 1984. I have evidence that he was framed and I am completing my next book about this. Implicating me in Hilda's murder radicalized me. Then after Chernobyl, I took up her anti-nuclear energy torch. 
I learned that the nuclear energy industry had begun as a cynical byproduct of the race to provide plutonium for nuclear weapons. My case for supporting nuclear deterrence crumbled with the Berlin Wall. However, it took the 1991 first Gulf War to break me out of my indoctrination. From the moment in November 1990, when the United States doubled its original figure for ground forces to eject Iraqi forces from Kuwait, I realized this was to be a punitive expedition. My military intelligence training warned me that the United States-led coalition's blitzkrieg strategy, targeting Iraq's infrastructure as well as the leadership and military, would give Saddam Hussein the pretext he needed to attack Israel in order to split the coalition and become the Arabs' champion. If personally threatened, he could order the launch of Scud ballistic missiles with chemical or biological warheads. If such an attack caused heavy Israeli casualties, Prime Minister Shamir would come under massive pressure to retaliate with a nuclear strike on Baghdad. Even if Saddam Hussein did not survive, and he had the best anti-nuclear bunkers Western technology could provide, the Arab world would erupt in fury against Israel and its allies, its security would be destroyed forever, and Russia would be sucked into the crisis. So in January 1991, I joined the growing anti-war movement in Britain and addressed a crowd of 20,000 in Trafalgar Square, of all places. A week later, the first Scud attack hit Tel Aviv, two days after the Allied Blitzkrieg began. For the first time, the second city of a de facto nuclear state was attacked and its capital threatened. Worse still for nuclear deterrence, Iraq did not have nuclear weapons. The Israeli people, cowering in gas masks in basements, learned that night that their so-called deterrent had failed in its primary purpose. 38 more conventionally armed Scud attacks followed, causing miraculously few casualties. When United States satellites detected Israeli nuclear-armed missiles being readied for launch, President Bush rushed Patriot missiles and military aid to Israel, which was congratulated on its restraint. Meanwhile, in Britain, the Irish Republican Army just missed wiping out the entire Gulf War cabinet with a mortar bomb attack from a van in central London. A more direct threat to the government could barely be imagined. What if instead they had threatened to use even a crude nuclear device? A counter threat of nuclear retaliation would have had zero credibility. Coming out against nuclear weapons was traumatic. My conversion was no sudden Damascene experience. I knew about indoctrination, the Official Secrets Act, and top security clearances linked to the carrots and sticks of a, of a career requiring me uncritically to accept the nuclear policies of my government. My circumstances were unique. I went through a process of cumulative experiences, including the murder of my aunt and mentor, in which British state security agents were allegedly involved. Nuclear weapons and power seem to make superficially democratic countries and governments behave badly. But lately, the reforce to research the history of the bomb, I learned that the British scientific politico-military establishment initiated and spread the nuclear arms race. Having alerted the United States to the feasibility of making a nuclear weapon, Britain participated in the Manhattan Project. On being frozen out of further collaboration by the 1946 McMahon Act, it began to develop its own nuclear arsenal. Thus, Britain became a role model for France, and later Iraq and India, the first medium-sized power with delusions of grandeur to threaten nuclear terrorism. Also, I learned that nuclear deterrence does not work. It is immoral and unlawful, and there are more credible and acceptable alternative strategies to deter aggression and achieve security. 
Having given up thatching as the 1991 Gulf War loomed, after my breakout, I became chair of the British affiliate of the World Corp project. This worldwide network of citizen groups helped persuade the United Nations General Assembly, despite desperate counter moves by the three NATO nuclear weapon states, to ask the International Court of Justice for its advisory opinion on the legal status of nuclear weapons. In 1996, the court confirmed that the threat, let alone use, of nuclear weapons would generally be illegal. For the first time, the legality of nuclear deterrence had been implicitly challenged. One aspect of the court's decision was especially important. It confirmed that as part of international humanitarian law, the Nuremberg principles apply to nuclear weapons. This has serious implications for all those involved in operating nuclear weapons, particularly military professionals who, unlike a president or prime minister, really would have to press the button. What is at stake here is a crucial difference between military professionals and hired killers or terrorists. Military professionals need to be seen to act within the law. Nuclear weapons should be stigmatized as chemical and biological weapons have been so that no military professional is prepared to operate them. The next year, 1997, Recently retired General Lee Butler, United States Air Force, spoke out far more powerfully than I could. He is still encouraging me to keep going. Then in 1999, I found myself with David Krieger in a delegation to Tokyo, not only with Lee Butler, but Robert McNamara as well. In a heretical team of that caliber, I knew what I was doing was right. I believe it was the American writer H. L. Mencken who quipped, I quote, there's always an easy solution to every problem, neat, plausible, and wrong, unquote. <laughs> Nuclear deterrence fits this nicely. To make it acceptable to political leaders and those in the military who have to operate them, the appalling effects of even the smallest modern nuclear weapon have been played down and that there is, would almost certainly be no need to use them. In fact, they are not weapons at all. They are utterly indiscriminate devices, combining the poisoning horrors of chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction, plus intergenerational genetic effects unique to radioactivity, with almost unimaginable explosive violence. Yet, nuclear deterrence is not credible without the will to use them. This is why a state practicing nuclear deterrence is actually conducting a deliberate policy of nuclear terrorism. My next fundamental objection relates to the fact that if deterrence based on conventional weapons fails, the damage is confined to the belligerent states and the environment recovers. What is at stake from nuclear deterrence failure is the devastation and poisoning not just of the belligerents, but potentially most forms of life on Earth. Closely related to this is a crazy reality. Nuclear deterrence is a scheme for making nuclear war less probable by making it more probable. The danger of inadvertent nuclear war is greater than we think. When nuclear deterrence dogma demands that the United States and Russia persist with over 2,000 nuclear warheads between them poised for launch at each other inside half an hour. What are they playing at 20 years after the Cold War ended and when they are collaborating in the so-called War on Terror? In fact, I now suspect that nuclear deterrence is an outrageous scam devised 60 years ago by the United States military industrial monster dominating US politics and foreign policy. President Barack Obama's vision for a nuclear weapon free world in his Prague speech in April 2009 was immediately contradicted by a caveat. He said, I quote, as long as these weapons exist, we will maintain a safe, secure and effective arsenal to deter any adversary 
and guarantee that, def that defense to our allies, unquote. This is old, muddled thinking, because a rational leader cannot make a credible nuclear threat against a nuclear adversary capable of a retaliatory strike. And a second strike is pointless because it would be no more than posthumous revenge. This is why enthusiasm for a nuclear weapon-free world is hypocrisy if some nuclear weapons will be kept for deterrence as long as anyone else has them. The deception deepens when the nuclear weapon states, aware that extremists armed with weapons of mass destruction cannot be deterred, plan preemptive nuclear attacks in anticipatory self-defense of their vital interests, not last-ditch defense of their homeland. Thereby, their unprovable claim that nuclear deterrence averts war is cynically stood on its head. Extremists would not only not be deterred by nuclear weapons, they could provoke nuclear retaliation in order to turn moral outrage against the retaliator and recruit more to their nightmarish causes. With such an irresponsible example from the five recognized nuclear weapon states, it is no surprise that India and Pakistan are trying to emulate it, locked toe-to-toe -to -toe in hostile rivalry. Indian governments became convinced that the fetishistic power of nuclear deterrence held the key to guaranteed security and acceptance as a great power, whereupon Pakistan promptly followed suit. I will never forget a public meeting in Islamabad in 2001. The nuclear physicist Dr. Pervez Hoodboy had persuaded General Aslam Beg, one of the fathers of Pakistan's bomb, to join a panel with himself and me. Beg warned against raising awareness of the effects of a nuclear strike on a Pakistan city in case it scares the people. He had a simplistic faith in nuclear deterrence, ignoring all the added dangers of a nuclear standoff with India. He is not alone. My experience is that most believers in nuclear deterrence refuse to discuss the consequences of failure. I will now confront them. In April 2005, an internal report for United States Homeland Security appeared on the web titled Economic Consequences of a Red Nuke Attack. The report examined what it would take to recover from the detonation of just one nuclear device in various cities. Much depends on the size of bomb and level of decontamination, but the economic consequences for New York alone would be around $10 trillion. That is roughly the annual gross domestic product of the entire United States economy. Just one nuclear bomb on one city. A deeply disturbing article published in January last year in Scientific American reported on recent climate research about a regional nuclear war between India and Pakistan in which only about 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear devices would be detonated over cities. Apart from the mutual carnage and destruction across South Asia, enough smoke from firestorms, let alone radioactive fallout, would be generated to cripple global agriculture. Plunging temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere would cause hundreds of millions of people to starve to death, even in countries far from the conflict. In 2004, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War published their findings regarding casualties from one Hiroshima-sized nuclear warhead detonated over New York. Total fatalities were estimated at about 60,000. Another 60,000 would be seriously but non-fatally injured. These would clearly, utterly overwhelm any hospitals surviving the explosion. Again, just one nuclear weapon on one city. The 2009 report, Eliminating Nuclear Threats, by the Australia-Japan International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, challenged the assumption that nuclear weapons have deterred major war. It acknowledged that avoidance of nuclear war 
has been due more to luck than deterrence. It agreed that nuclear weapons are worse than useless to deter terrorists. It correctly argued that just because nuclear weapons cannot be uninvented, this does not mean they should not be outlawed and abolished as chemical and biological weapons have been. Surprisingly, the report, chaired by former foreign ministers of Australia and Japan, also questioned the need for extended nuclear deterrence, arguing that conventional deterrence was adequate. Yet, having admitted that extended nuclear deterrence undermines progress towards a nuclear weapon-free world, it failed to follow the logic of its criticisms. No doubt this was because, unlike New Zealand, Australia and Japan continue to fall for the hoax of nuclear deterrence. The report should have concluded that extended nuclear deterrence does not make Japan or Australia secure and is not credible. The misnamed nuclear umbrella has helped the United States maintain its military alliances and bases in both countries for its own purposes. However, the umbrella is really a lightning rod for insecurity because the United States risks being pushed past the nuclear threshold when its own security is not directly threatened. Besides, why would any state attack Australia or Japan, let alone with nuclear weapons? If it did, the United States would almost certainly not respond with nuclear weapons, because it would risk inevitable, uncontrollable escalation to full-scale nuclear war. Instead, if the United States decided it was in its national interest to come to their defense, it would rely on its formidable conventional firepower. Nuclear deterrence has not prevented non-nuclear states from attacking allies of nuclear weapon states. Examples include China entering the Korean War when the United States had a nuclear monopoly in 1950, Argentina invading the British Falkland Islands in 1982, and Iraq invading close ally Kuwait in 1990 and attacking nuclear-armed Israel with Scud missiles in 1991. In all these cases, nuclear deterrence failed. The United States and Korea and Vietnam and the Soviet Union in Afghanistan preferred withdrawal to the ultimate ignominy of, restoring to of resorting to nuclear weapons to secure victory or revenge against a non-nuclear state. The main security threats in the 21st century include climate change, poverty, resource depletion, and financial crises, as well as terrorism. Nuclear deterrence, provoking hostility and mistrust, prevents rather than assists the global non-military cooperation required to solve them. For all these reasons, all but about 35 states feel more secure without depending on nuclear deterrence. And after Japan's and Australia's admirable leadership, through co-sponsoring their recent report, they, South Korea, and NATO's non-nuclear members should therefore join the 140 states now supporting negotiating a nuclear weapons convention. In Britain, a defense budget crisis has revived the debate about replacing Trident and uncritical British support for American foreign policy. Indeed, the black hole in defense spending has been caused by desperate attempts to keep up with the Americans. Such poor decisions were driven by British nuclear dependence on the United States. Instead, making a virtue from necessity, the British government should reassert its sovereignty and announce that it will rescue the dysfunctional nuclear non-proliferation regime by becoming the first of the recognized nuclear weapon states to rely on safer and more cost-effective security strategies than nuclear deterrence. A new world role awaits the British. By far the best placed candidate for breakout, Britain's nuclear arsenal is the smallest of the five recognized nuclear weapon states, and they are deployed in just one system, a scaled-down version of Trident. Its government has to decide by 2016 whether to replace Trident with whatever the United States decides. The minority Liberal Democrats, in coalition with the Conservatives, oppose Trident replacement. Their alternative, 
nuclear-tipped cruise missiles launched from attack submarines has recently been ruled out because the Obama administration is scrapping its nuclear-armed Tomahawk missiles. All Britain has to do is decide not to replace its four Vanguard-class Trident-armed submarines. British breakout will be sensational, transforming the nuclear disarmament debate overnight. In NATO, Britain would wield unprecedented influence, leading the drive for a non-nuclear strategy. British leadership would create new openings for shifting the mindset in the United States and France, the other two most zealous guardians of nuclear deterrence. This would heavily influence India, Israel, Pakistan, and states' intent on obtaining nuclear weapons. The way would then open for a major reassessment by Russia and China, for all nuclear forces to be stood down, and for negotiations to begin on a nuclear weapons convention. And the key is to see nuclear disarmament as a security building process, moving from an outdated adversarial mindset to a cooperative one, where nuclear weapons are recognized as an, in, as an irrelevant security liability. To conclude, I hope I have explained why I rejected nuclear deterrence and why it is the last major obstacle to a nuclear weapon-free world. Finding our way back from the nuclear abyss, on the edge of which nuclear deterrence has held us hypnotized and terrorized for 65 years, will not be easy. As with all advances in human rights and justice, the engine for shifting the mindset has to come from you. To conclude, again, I recall what Mahatma Gandhi said in 1938 as he launched the final push towards evicting the British from India. I quote, a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history, unquote. I believe it was the American anthropologist Margaret Mead who added, indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. A surprisingly small network of individuals drove the campaign to abolish slavery. As with nuclear deterrence, slavery's leading apologists were the power elites of the United States, Britain, and France. They argued that slavery was, quote, a necessary evil for which there was no alternative. They failed because courageous, ordinary British, American, and French citizens mobilized unstoppable public and political support for their campaign to replace slavery with more humane, lawful, and effective ways to create wealth. The analogy holds for nuclear deterrence, which can and must be discarded for more humane, lawful, and safer security strategies if civilization and the Earth's ecosystems are to survive. Thank you very much. My impression is that if any, uh, anyone used a nuclear weapon, all the rest of the world would be against that one country that did that. They wouldn't have to just fight the country they bombed, but the rest, all, entire rest of the world. I think you're right. Um, and, and this raises the very crucial issue of um, breakout in a nuclear weapon-free world, um, because this is one of the great canards that the pro-nuclear lobby um, run with at the moment. Um, it is that um, these nuclear weapons are, are always going to be so valuable that um, there's still going to be this yearning to have one, to hide one away. And, and, and they can't think past that. And, uh, and my first response to them, of course, is that in order to even get to a nuclear weapon-free world, we will have all, including your government and the Pentagon, have been convinced and bribed and generally um, persuaded that uh, nuclear weapons are a security liability and a dangerous problem um, and don't provide security. And so that's the, sh that's the mindset shift that's going to have to be achieved, the trick. 
Um, and then, of course, if there is any attempt by, obviously it would be a madman or a terrorist, to use them still, to ignore it, um, then the, the response, I think, would be fierce and it would be conventional. In uh, looking at things, do you see any uh, beginning division between the military and civilian uh, government officials, the, the, the democratic civilian things such as our Congress and, and so on like that, in the question of the value of nuclear weapons? It seems to me that there is occurring within the military a beginning feeling that they're really not of much value in their role, but they seem to have a hard time convincing the civilian governments of that case. Yep, good question. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, you're right. Um, it's one of the more endearing um, attributes of the military is that sometimes they do think straight. Um, and they don't get carried away by um, propaganda all the time, especially if they have to do the job themselves. It concentrates the mind. Um, and there's no doubt in Britain um, that the army has uh, been persuaded that nuclear weapons are a mistake and we should not be spending any more money on nuclear weapons uh, because they're taking all the hits in all these new wars. First of all, they're not on the coast and secondly, uh, it, it's, um, it's the poor bloody infantry as ever that's taking it and nuclear weapons are totally irrelevant and they haven't got the proper equipment to fight those wars because it's starved, because of the money that's been wasted on these nuclear boondoggles. And um, so, yep, they've got the message, but they are suppressed because there is this little group in the Navy which has this special high, um, you know, value, huh, uh, high prestige role, which is not military, it's political, um, for going around um, saying we're still a big uh, country that can punch above its weight. And um, so that is a faction within the Navy. It's, they're known as the Black Mafia, by the way, um, the nuclear submariners. Um, and so that is a problem. To, to, but they can be hopefully sidelined by sheer um, numbers, and they are damaging the rest of the dwindling fleet, you know, the fleet that's being cut. Um, so it's a very interesting moment in Britain, but the politicians uh, are, are pretty um, hopeless. Um, they're very superficial. They respond to um, arguments from little Englanders like, and, and I am not, this is not a joke, by the way. Um, when asked, um, why does Britain need to keep its nuclear weapons now? They, a lot of them will say, it's the French. <laughs> It's true, and that is the argument they will use. It'll come out, and we've got to be ready to treat it with the derision it deserves. But, oh, it's potent still. We're still fighting the Napoleonic Wars. And you may or may not know that two years ago, um, the ultimate in pantomime farce happened when the British uh, ballistic missile submarine collided with the French one on patrol. Fortunately, with minimal damage. But can you imagine if they'd gone head on into each other at high speed? They were all fully loaded. If uh, President Obama believes in deterrence, then I have absolutely no faith in a political solution at all, f f you know, to make this happen. And, um, you know, the recent events in Egypt, um, the, the, the populist uprising there, gives me a lot of faith that if the people of the world could unite in major cities globally, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the only way to diffuse the planet. Sure, I think we're working on it. Um, but um, I wouldn't give up completely on, on Obama. Um, he must be under the most intolerable pressure. And I believe that he was very courageous to make that speech at all, let alone, um, you know, to try to do something about it. Um, uh, so I think he set the sort of vision. Uh, he had to put that caveat in, or he might even be dead by now. All right? You, you've got to face that. 
This is what this country does to its leaders when they really stick their necks out. So it's, you know, gently, gently, softly, softly, catchy monkey. Um, I, I really do believe he's, he can only do it in stages, so don't give up on him. You mentioned uh, keeping, getting our, our leaders to get their heads on straight. How do we do that with the dialogue that's going on now in the United States, particularly coming from the, the right? Because it seems to me everything's gone back into discussion in Cold War terms. We're, we're behind the Russians. We're locked into a, a start locks us into a, a position of permanent inferiority. It's a numbers game. How do we get around that? Um, well, I think there is certain um, value in allowing some uh, people like that to give them more rope. They hang themselves. I mean, it's a pretty brutal expression, but um, it sometimes works. Um, they are, I believe, uh, I have seen some of the behavior by some of the crazier Tea Party candidates, and they are hanging themselves amongst themselves. They're becoming embarrassed by themselves, you know, by their colleagues. So that's a start. Um, and the other thing is, if you're looking at the old Cold War thinking, then I think people are moving on. I know there are still people who are trying to keep Georgia going, you know, and stuff like this to, to irritate the Russians. Uh, but I think the, the, um, the up-and-coming leaders are looking to China. And I think China is a very interesting case. And um, I don't want to go on too long about this, but if I tell you that there were two events that happened just recently uh, when Robert Gates, uh, he's uh, your defense secretary, visited Beijing. Most unusually, China un rolled uh, rolled out a new stealth fighter uh, for the public to see. This is very unlike Chinese behavior. Normally they're extremely secretive. And there was a panic in the Pentagon. Um, forget the fact that this is a, a possibly a cardboard mock-up which um, will not be operational for 20 years. A few days later, China uh, uh, leaks the information that um, it has an anti-aircraft carrier ballistic missile with a conventional warhead. Next panic from the Pentagon. But the Pentagon also can see this as useful because they can immediately say to Obama, don't you even think about cutting this defense budget because of this new threat. They always need new threats to justify. But now I introduce you, well, I, I'm being arrogant, you will, many of you know, about the ancient Chinese leader, military leader, Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu had some rules about dealing with your enemies. Rule one, attack an enemy or approach an enemy at his weakest point. And in this country, I'm afraid to say, the weakest point is now the economy. Rule two, if possible, avoid ever going to war. And I think this is the ultimate exponent of asymmetric warfare where they are goading and encouraging the Pentagon and all the hawks to keep piling it on and going ever and ever for more and more military stuff until this country goes finally bankrupt and China cruises through without firing a shot. You should tell your leaders that. Get that message across.